Sumerian is the language of ancient Sumer and a language isolate that was spoken in Mesopotamia modern-day Iraq. During the 3rd millennium BC, an intimate cultural symbiosis developed between the Sumerians and the Semitic-speaking Akkadians, which included widespread bilingualism. The influence of Sumerian and the East Semitic language Akkadian on each other is evident in all areas, from lexical borrowing on a substantial scale, to syntactic, morphological, and phonological convergence. This has prompted scholars to refer to Sumerian and Akkadian in the 3rd millennium BC as a sprachbund. Akkadian gradually replaced Sumerian as a spoken language around 2000 BC, the exact dating being subject to debate, but Sumerian continued to be used as a sacred, ceremonial, literary, and scientific language in Akkadian speaking Mesopotamian states such as Assyria and Babylonia until the 1st century AD. Thereafter it was likely forgotten until the 19th century, when Assyriologists began deciphering the cuneiform inscriptions and excavated tablets left by these speakers. <laughs> Stages The history of written Sumerian can be divided into several periods Archaic Sumerian 31st-26th century BC Old or Classical Sumerian 26th–23rd century BC Neo-Sumerian 23rd–21st stone century BC Late Sumerian 20th–18th century BC Post-Sumerian, after 1700 BC Archaic Sumerian is the earliest stage of inscriptions with linguistic content, beginning with the Gemdit Nasser Uruk III period from about the 31st to 30th centuries BC. It succeeds the proto-literate period, which spans roughly the 35th to 30th centuries. Some versions of the chronology may omit the late Sumerian phase and regard all texts written after 2000 BC as post-Sumerian. The term, post-Sumerian, is meant to refer to the time when the language was already extinct and preserved by Babylonians and Assyrians only as a liturgical and classical language for religious, artistic and scholarly purposes. The extinction has traditionally been dated approximately to the end of the Third Dynasty of Ur, the last predominantly Sumerian state in Mesopotamia, about 2000 BC. However, that date is very approximate, as many scholars have contended that Sumerian was already dead or dying as early as around 2100 BC, by the beginning of the Ur III period, and others believe that Sumerian persisted, as a spoken language, in a small part of southern Mesopotamia Nippur and its surroundings until as late as 1700 BC. Whatever the status of spoken Sumerian between 2000 and 1700 BC, it is from then that a particularly large quantity of literary texts and bilingual Sumerian Akkadian lexical lists survive, especially from the scribal school of Nippur. They and the particularly intensive official and literary use of the language in Akkadian speaking states during the same time call for a distinction between the late Sumerian and the post Sumerian periods. Dialects The standard variety of Sumerian was Eme G. I. R. A notable variety or sociolect was Eme Sal, Eme, Sal. Possibly to be interpreted as fine tongue or high pitched voice. Rubio, 2007, p. 1369. Other terms for dialects or registers were Eme Gallum, high tongue, Eme C. Saw, straight tongue. Im te na, oblique tongue, etc. Im sal is used exclusively by female characters in some literary texts that may be compared to the female languages or language varieties that exist or have existed in some cultures, such as among the Chukchis and the island Caribs. In addition, it is dominant in certain genres of cult songs. The special features of im sal are mostly phonological, for example, m is often used instead of g, i.e., as in me as opposed to the g, e26, i, but words different from the standard language are also used gasa and rather than standard nin, lady. Topic. Grammatical overview Sumerian is an agglutinative, split ergative, and subject-object verb language. It behaves as a nominative accusative language in the first and second persons of the incomplete tense aspect, but as ergative absolutive in most other forms of the indicative mood. Sumerian nouns are organized in two grammatical genders based on animacy, animate and inanimate. 
Animate nouns include humans, gods, and in some instances the word for statue. Suffixes mark a noun's case, absolutive o, ergative e, dative, allative r, a, animate, e inanimate, to, for, genitive a, k, of, locative a, only inanimate, in, et, commutative da, with, equative jin, as, like, directive, adverbial s, e, toward, ablative ta, only inanimate, from. The naming and number of cases vary according to differing analyses of Sumerian linguistics. Noun phrases are right branching with adjectives and modifiers following nouns. Sumerian verbs have a tense aspect complex, contrasting complete and incomplete actions, states. The two have different conjugations and many have different roots. Verbs also mark mood, voice, polarity, iterativity, and intensity, and agree with subjects and objects in number, person, animacy, and case. Sumerian moods are, indicative, imperative, cohortative, precative, affirmative, prospective aspect, cohortative mood, affirmative, negative volative, and realized volative, negative, affirmative, polarative, and are marked by a verbal prefix. The prefixes appear to conflate mood, aspect, and polarity, and their meanings are also affected by the tense aspect complex. Sumerian voices are, active, and middle or passive. Verbs are marked for three persons, first, second, third, in two numbers, singular and plural. Finite verbs have three classes of prefixes, modal prefixes, conjugational prefixes, and pronominal, dimensional prefixes. Modal prefixes confer the above moods on the verb. Conjugational prefixes are thought to confer perhaps venative, andative, being, action, focus, valency, or voice distinctions on the verb. Pronominal, dimensional prefixes correspond to noun phrases and their cases. Non-finite verbs include participles and relative clause verbs, both formed through nominalization. Finite verbs take prefixes and suffixes, non-finite verbs only take suffixes. Verbal roots are mostly monosyllabic, though verbal root duplication and suppletion can also occur to indicate plurality. Root duplication can also indicate iterativity or intensity of the verb. Topic. Classification. Sumerian is a language isolate. Ever since decipherment, it has been the subject of much effort to relate it to a wide variety of languages. Because it has a peculiar prestige as the most ancient written language, proposals for linguistic affinity sometimes have a nationalistic background. Such proposals enjoy virtually no support amongst linguists because of their unverifiability. Sumerian was at one time widely held to be an Indo-European language, but that view later came to be almost universally rejected. A few examples of proposed linguistic affiliations include Kartvelian languages, Nicholas Marr, Munda languages, Igor M. Diakonov, Dravidian languages, see Alamo Dravidian, Uralic languages, Simo Parpola, or more generally, Ural Altaic languages, Simo Parpola, C. G. Gostoni, Andras Zakar, Ida Babala, Basque language, Alexi Sahala, Nostratic languages, Alan Baumhard, Sino-Tibetan languages, specifically Tibeto-Burman languages, Jan Braun, following C. J. Ball, V. Christian, and K. Buddha. Dene Caucasian languages John Benson It has also been suggested that the Sumerian language descended from a late Paleolithic Creole language Hoyrup 1992. However, no conclusive evidence, only some typological features, can be found to support Hoyrup's view. A more widespread hypothesis posits a Proto-Euphradian language that preceded Sumerian in southern Mesopotamia and exerted an aerial influence on it, especially in the form of polysyllabic words that appear un-Sumerian making them suspect of being loanwords and are not traceable to any other known language. There is little speculation as to the affinities of this substratum language, or these languages, and it is thus best treated as unclassified. Researchers such as Gonzalo Rubio disagree with the assumption of a single substratum language and argue that several languages are involved. A related proposal by Gordon Whitaker is that the language of the proto-literary texts from the late Uruk period c. BC is really an early Indo-European language which he terms Euphratic. Topic. Writing system Topic. Development The Sumerian language is one of the earliest known written languages. 
The proto literate period of Sumerian writing spans c. 3300 to 3000 BC. In this period, records are purely logographic, with phonological content. The oldest document of the proto literate period is the Kish tablet. Falkenstein 1936 lists 939 signs used in the proto-literate period late Uruk, 34th to 31st centuries. Records with unambiguously linguistic content, identifiably Sumerian, are those found at Jemdet Nasser, dating to the 31st or 30th century BC. From about 2600 BC, the logographic symbols were generalized using a wedge-shaped stylus to impress the shapes into wet clay. This cuneiform wedge-shaped Mode of writing co-existed with the pre-cuneiform archaic mode. Daimel 1922 lists 870 signs used in the early dynastic Ia period 26th century. In the same period the large set of logographic signs had been simplified into a logosyllabic script comprising several hundred signs. Rosengarten 1967 lists 468 signs used in Sumerian pre-Sargonian Lagash. The pre-Sargonian period of the 26th to 24th centuries BC is the classical Sumerian stage of the language. The cuneiform script was adapted to Akkadian writing beginning in the mid-3rd millennium. Our knowledge of Sumerian is based on Akkadian glossaries. During the Sumerian Renaissance er three of the 21st century BC, Sumerian was written in already highly abstract cuneiform glyphs directly succeeded by Old Assyrian cuneiform. Topic. Transcription Depending on the context, a cuneiform sign can be read either as one of several possible logograms, each of which corresponds to a word in the Sumerian spoken language, as a phonetic syllable v, vc, cv, or cvc, or as a determinative a marker of semantic category, such as occupation or place. See the article Transliterating Cuneiform Languages. Some Sumerian logograms were written with multiple cuneiform signs. These logograms are called Deary spellings, after the logogram Deary, which is written with the signs SI and A. The text transliteration of a tablet will show just the logogram, such as the word Deary, not the separate component signs. Not all epigraphists are equally reliable, and before a scholar publishes an important treatment of a text, the scholar will often arrange to collate the published transcription against the actual tablet, to see if any signs, especially broken or damaged signs, should be represented differently. Topic. Historiography The key to reading logosyllabic cuneiform came from the Behistun inscription, a trilingual cuneiform inscription written in Old Persian, Elamite, and Akkadian. In a similar manner, the key to understanding Egyptian hieroglyphs was the bilingual Rosetta Stone and Jean Francois Champollion's transcription in 1822. In 1838 Henry Rawlinson, building on the 1802 work of Georg Friedrich Grotefend, was able to decipher the old Persian section of the Behistun inscriptions, using his knowledge of modern Persian. When he recovered the rest of the text in 1843, he and others were gradually able to translate the Elamite and Akkadian sections of it, starting with the 37 signs he had deciphered for the old Persian. Meanwhile, many more cuneiform texts were coming to light from archaeological excavations, mostly in the Semitic Akkadian language, which were duly deciphered. By 1850, however, Edward Hinks came to suspect a non-Semitic origin for cuneiform. Semitic languages are structured according to consonantal forms, whereas cuneiform, when functioning phonetically, was a syllabary, binding consonants to particular vowels. Furthermore, no Semitic words could be found to explain the syllabic values given to particular signs. Julius Oppert suggested that a non-Semitic language had preceded Akkadian in Mesopotamia, and that speakers of this language had developed the cuneiform script. In 1855 Rawlinson announced the discovery of non-Semitic inscriptions at the southern Babylonian sites of Nippur, Larsa, and Uruk. In 1856, Hinks argued that the untranslated language was agglutinative in character. The language was called Scythic by some, and, confusingly, Akkadian by others. In 1869, Oppert proposed the name Sumerian, based on the known title, King of Sumer and Akkad, reasoning that if Akkad signified the Semitic portion of the kingdom, Sumer might describe the non-Semitic annex. 
Credit for being first to scientifically treat a bilingual Sumerian Akkadian text belongs to Paul Haupt, who published Die Sumerischen Familiengesetz the Sumerian Family Laws in 1879. Ernest de Sarzek began excavating the Sumerian site of Tello, ancient Gursu, capital of the state of Lagash, in 1877, and published the first part of Découvertes en Chalde with transcriptions of Sumerian tablets in 1884. The University of Pennsylvania began excavating Sumerian Nippur in 1888. A classified list of Sumerian ideographs by R. Brunau appeared in 1889. The bewildering number and variety of phonetic values that signs could have in Sumerian led to an unfortunate detour in understanding the language. A Paris based Orientalist, Joseph Halevi, argued from 1874 onward that Sumerian was not a natural language, but rather a secret code, a cryptolect, and for over a decade the leading Assyriologists battled over this issue. For a dozen years, starting in 1885, even the great Friedrich de Leach accepted Halevi's arguments, not renouncing Halevi until 1897. François Thoreau Dangan working at the Louvre in Paris also made significant contributions to deciphering Sumerian with publications from 1898 to 1938, such as his 1905 publication of Les Inscriptions de Sumer et de Cod. Charles Fossey at the Collège de France in Paris was another prolific and reliable scholar. His pioneering contribution Au Dictionnaire Sumerian Assyrian, Paris 1905-1907, turns out to provide the foundation for P. Anton Dimel's 1934 Sumerisch Akkadisches Glosser volume. Three of Dimel's four-volume Sumerisches Lexicon. In 1908, Stephen Herbert Langdon summarized the rapid expansion in knowledge of Sumerian and Akkadian vocabulary in the pages of Babylonica, a journal edited by Charles Varolo, in an article. Sumerian Assyrian Vocabularies", which reviewed a valuable new book on rare logograms by Bruno Meissner. Subsequent scholars have found Langdon's work, including his tablet transcriptions, to be not entirely reliable. In 1944, a more careful Sumerologist, Samuel Noah Kramer, provided a detailed and readable summary of the decipherment of Sumerian in his Sumerian mythology. Friedrich de Leach published a learned Sumerian dictionary and grammar in the form of his Sumerisches Glosser and Grunzuch der Sumerischen Grammatik, both appearing in 1914. De Leach's student, Arno Pobel, published a grammar with the same title, Grunzuch der Sumerischen Grammatik, in 1923, and for 50 years it would be the standard for students studying Sumerian. Pobel's grammar was finally superseded in 1984 on the publication of the Sumerian language, an introduction to its history and grammatical structure, by Marie-Louise Thompson. While much of Thompson's understanding of Sumerian grammar would now be rejected by most or all Sumerologists, Thompson's grammar often with express mention of the critiques put forward by Pascal Adinger in his 1993 Elements de linguistique sumérienne, La construction de 11 e, d, dire, is the starting point of most recent academic discussions of Sumerian grammar. More recent monograph-length grammars of Sumerian include Dietz Otto Edzard's 2003 Sumerian Grammar and Bram Yeagersma's 2010 A Descriptive Grammar of Sumerian currently digital, but soon to be printed in revised form by Oxford University Press. Peter Michalowski's essay entitled, simply, Sumerian, in the 2004 The Cambridge Encyclopedia of the World's Ancient Languages has also been recognized as a good modern grammatical sketch. There is relatively little consensus, even among reasonable Sumerologists, in comparison to the state of most modern or classical languages. Verbal morphology in particular is hotly disputed. In addition to the general grammars, there are many monographs and articles about particular areas of Sumerian grammar, without which a survey of the field could not be considered complete. The primary institutional lexical effort in Sumerian is the Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary Project, begun in 1974. In 2004, the PSD was released on the web as the EPSD. The project is currently supervised by Steve Tinney. It has not been updated online since 2006, but Tinney and colleagues are working on a new edition of the EPSD, a working draft of which is available online. Topic. Phonology and grammar Typologically, as mentioned above, Sumerian is classified as an agglutinative, split-ergative language. 
Ever since its decipherment, the research of Sumerian has been made difficult not only by the lack of any native speakers, but also by the relative sparseness of linguistic data, the apparent lack of a closely related language, and the features of the writing system. Assumed phonological or morphological forms will be between slashes, with plain text used for the standard Assyriological transcription of Sumerian. Most of the following examples are unattested. Topic. Phonemic inventory Modern knowledge of Sumerian phonology is flawed and incomplete because of the lack of native speakers, the transmission through the filter of Akkadian phonology and the difficulties posed by the cuneiform script. As I. M. Diakonoff observes, "...when we try to find out the morphophonological structure of the Sumerian language, we must constantly bear in mind that we are not dealing with a language directly but are reconstructing it from a very imperfect mnemonic writing system which had not been basically aimed at the rendering of morphophonemics." Consonants <inaudible> 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 Sumerian is conjectured to have at least the following consonants A simple distribution of six stop consonants, in three places of articulation distinguished by aspiration, though later stages may have featured voicing P voiceless aspirated bilabial plosive T voiceless aspirated alveolar plosive K voiceless aspirated velar plosive As a rule, P, T, and, K, did not occur word finally B voiced unaspirated bilabial plosive D voiced unaspirated alveolar plosive G voiced unaspirated velar plosive A phoneme usually represented by R sometimes written drive that was probably a voiceless aspirated alveolar affricate This phoneme later became D or R in northern and southern dialects respectively A simple distribution of three nasal consonants in similar distribution to the stops M bilabial nasal N alveolar nasal G frequently printed G due to typesetting constraints increasingly transcribed as likely a velar nasal as in sing it has also been argued to be a labiovelar nasal or a nasalized labiovelar a set of three sibilants S likely a voiceless alveolar fricative Z likely a voiceless unaspirated alveolar affricate T S as shown by Akkadian loans from S equals T S to Sumerian Z. In early Sumerian, this would have been the unaspirated counterpart to R S, generally described as a voiceless postalveolar fricative, as in ship H a velar fricative X, sometimes written H. Two liquid consonants L a lateral consonant. R a rhotic consonant the existence of various other consonants has been hypothesized based on graphic alternations and loans, though none have found wide acceptance. For example, Diakonoff lists evidence for two L sounds, two R sounds, two H sounds, and two G sounds excluding the velar nasal, and assumes a phonemic difference between consonants that are dropped word finally such as the G in zag greater than za 3 and consonants that remain such as the G in lag. Other. Hidden. Consonant phonemes that have been suggested include semivowels such as j, and, with, and a glottal fricative, h, or a glottal stop that could explain the absence of vowel contraction in some words, though objections have been raised against that as well. A recent descriptive grammar by Bram Jaegersma includes j, h, and as unwritten consonants, with the glottal stop even serving as the first person pronominal prefix. Very often, a word final consonant was not expressed in writing, and was possibly omitted in pronunciation, so it surfaced only when followed by a vowel, for example, the k of the genitive case ending ak does not appear in e2 lugola, the king's house, but it becomes obvious in e2 lugola cam, it is the king's house. Compare liaison in French. Topic. Vowels The vowels that are clearly distinguished by the cuneiform script are a, e, i, and u. Various researchers have posited the existence of more vowel phonemes such as o, and even and which would have been concealed by the transmission through Akkadian, as that language does not distinguish them. That would explain the seeming existence of numerous homophones in transliterated Sumerian, as well as some details of the phenomena mentioned in the next paragraph. These hypotheses are not yet generally accepted. 
There is some evidence for vowel harmony according to vowel height or advanced tongue root in the prefix i3, e in inscriptions from pre sargonic Lagash, and perhaps even more than one vowel harmony rule. There also appear to be many cases of partial or complete assimilation of the vowel of certain prefixes and suffixes to one in the adjacent syllable reflected in writing in some of the later periods, and there is a noticeable, albeit not absolute, tendency for disyllabic stems to have the same vowel in both syllables. These patterns, too, are interpreted as evidence for a richer vowel inventory by some researchers. What appears to be vowel contraction in hiatus asterisk, a, asterisk, ia, asterisk per astronomical unit, greater than a, asterisk, a, greater than a, asterisk, u, greater than u, etc. is also very common. Syllables could have any of the following structures, v, cv, vc, cvc. More complex syllables, if Sumerian had them, are not expressed as such by the cuneiform script. Topic. Grammar Topic. Nominal morphology The Sumerian noun is typically a one or two syllable root i g i i e two house household nin lady although there are also some roots with three syllables like sakanka market there are two grammatical genders usually called human and non-human the first includes gods and the word for statue in some instances, but not plants or animals, the latter also includes collective plural nouns, whose assignment is semantically predictable. The adjectives and other modifiers follow the noun Lugal ma, great king. The noun itself is not inflected, rather, grammatical markers attach to the noun phrase as a whole, in a certain order. Typically, that order would be noun, adjective, numeral, genitive phrase, relative clause, possessive marker, plural marker, case marker, for example, dig, ir gal gal g, u ne ra, god great, reduplicated, my plural dative, equals, for all my great gods. The possessive, plural and case markers are traditionally referred to as suffixes. But have recently also been described as enclitics or postpositions. The plural markers are e, ne, optional for nouns of the human gender. Non-human nouns are not marked by a plural suffix. However, plurality can also be expressed with the adjective hia, various, with the plural of the copula mes by reduplication of the noun ker ker, all foreign lands, or of the following adjective a gal gal, all the great waters. Reduplication is believed to signify totality or by the plurality of only the verb form. Plural reference in the verb form occurs only for human nouns. The case markers are o, absolutive, e, ergative, e, allative. Topic. Two. Ak, genitive, jin, equative. As like. R a, dative. Topic two four indirect object e s e traditionally called terminative case but means towards da commutative topic together with a locative in et ta ablative Topic. From, by. Additional spatial or temporal meanings can be expressed by genitive phrases like, at the head of, above, at the face of. Topic. In front of, at the outer side of. Because of. Etc. Bar Udu had two aka. Topic. Outer dot side sheep white genitive locative. In the outer side of a white sheep. Equals. Because of a white sheep. The attested independent personal pronouns are written g e 26 e first p sing z 2 e second p sing a ne or e ne third p sing human and a e ne ne third p place human 
The possessive pronominal morphemes are written G, U10, first P, sing, Zu, second P, sing, A, N, I, third P, sing. Human, B, I, third P, sing, place non-human, also demonstrative and collective, me, first pers. Place, Zu ne ne, second P, place, and A, ne ne, third pers. Pl, animate. For most of the suffixes, vowels are subject to loss if they are attached to vowel final words. The embedded structure of the noun phrase can be illustrated with the phrase sipad udu siki ak ak in the shepherds of woolly sheep, where the first genitive morpheme a k subordinates siki wool to udu sheep, and the second subordinates udu siki a k sheep of wool or woolly sheep to sipad shepherd. Topic. Verbal morphology Topic. General The Sumerian finite verb distinguishes a number of moods and agrees more or less consistently with the subject and the object in person, number and gender. The verb chain may also incorporate pronominal references to the verb's other modifiers, which has also traditionally been described as agreement. Although, in fact, such a reference and the presence of an actual modifier in the clause need not co-occur, not only e2 say 3 ib2 c do un, I'm going to the house, but also e2 say 3 i3 do un, I'm going to the house, and simply ib2 c do un, I'm going to it, are possible. The Sumerian verb also makes a binary distinction according to a category that some regard as tense past versus present future, others as aspect perfective versus imperfective, and that will be designated as ta tense aspect in the following. The two members of the opposition entail different conjugation patterns and, at least for many verbs, different stems, they are theory neutrally referred to with the Akkadian grammatical terms for the two respective forms hamtu quick and maru slow, fat. Finally, opinions differ on whether the verb has a passive or a middle voice and how it is expressed. The verbal root is almost always a monosyllable and, together with various affixes, forms a so-called verbal chain which is described as a sequence of about 15 slots, though the precise models differ. The finite verb has both prefixes and suffixes, while the non-finite verb may only have suffixes. Broadly, the prefixes have been divided in three groups that occur in the following order, modal prefixes conjugation prefixes and pronominal and dimensional prefixes the suffixes are a future or imperfective marker ed pronominal suffixes and an a ending that nominalizes the whole verb chain topic <laughs> modal prefixes the modal prefixes are o indicative Nu, and, la, li, negative, la, and, li, are used before the conjugation prefixes ba and by two. Ga, cohortative, let me, us. Ha, or, he, with further assimilation of the vowel in later periods precative or affirmative. U, perspective, after, when, if, also used as a mild imperative. Ma, negative or affirmative. Bara, negative or vetative. News, unrealizable wish, and saw, with further assimilation of the vowel in later periods affirmative, their meaning can depend on the ta. Topic. Conjugation prefixes The meaning, structure, identity and even the number of conjugation prefixes have always been a subject of disagreements. The term conjugation prefix simply alludes to the fact that a finite verb in the indicative mood must always contain one of them. Some of their most frequent expressions in writing are mu, i3, ed lagas variant, e, ba, by 2, ed lagas, by or b2, im, im ma, ed lagas e ma, im me, ed lagas i3 me or e me, me, always followed by pronominal dimensional ni and al, and to a lesser extent a, m3, m3 ma, and m3 me. Virtually all analyses attempt to describe many of the above as combinations or allomorphs of each other. The starting point of most analyses are the obvious facts that the first person dative always requires mu, and that the verb in a passive clause without an overt agent tends to have ba. Proposed explanations usually revolve around the subtleties of spatial grammar, information structure, focus, verb valency, and, most recently, voice. 
Mu, IM and M3 have been described as ventive morphemes, while BA and BI2 are sometimes analyzed as actually belonging to the pronominal dimensional group inanimate pronominal, B, plus dative, A, or directive, I. I'm ma, I'm me, I'm three ma and I'm three me are then considered by some as a combination of the ventive and ba, bi, or otherwise a variety of the ventive. I3 has been argued to be a mere prothetic vowel, al a stative prefix, ba a middle voice prefix, etc. Topic. Pronominal and dimensional prefixes The dimensional prefixes of the verb chain basically correspond to, and often repeat, the case markers of the noun phrase. Like the latter, they are attached to a head, a pronominal prefix. The other place where a pronominal prefix can be placed is immediately before the stem, where it can have a different allomorph and expresses the absolutive or the ergative participant the transitive subject, the intransitive subject or the direct object, depending on the ta and other factors, as explained below. However, this neat system is obscured by the tendency to drop or merge many of the prefixes in writing and possibly in pronunciation as well. Da, ta, si, early say three, occurring in this order, are the commutative, ablative and terminative verbal prefixes, the dative occurring before the others is probably a, and a directive, i, occurring after the others is widely recognized as well. The pronominal prefixes are, n, and, b, for the third person singular animate and inanimate respectively, the second person singular appears as e in most contexts, but as, r, before the dative, ra, leading some to assume a phonetic, ir, or, junior. The first person may appear as e, too, but is more commonly not expressed at all the same may frequently apply to third and second persons, it is, however, cued by the choice of mu as conjugation prefix, mu, plus, a, ma. The first, second and third plural infixes are mi, re, and ne in the dative and perhaps in other contexts as well, though not in the pre-stem position see below. An additional exception from the system is the prefix ni which corresponds to a noun phrase in the locative, in which case it doesn't seem to be preceded by a pronominal prefix, and, according to Gabor Zoliomi and others, to an animate one in the directive, in the latter case it is analyzed as pronominal, n, plus directive, i. Zoliomi and others also believe that special meanings can be expressed by combinations of non-identical noun case and verb prefix. Also according to some researchers, ni, and, by, acquire the forms, n, and, b, coinciding with the absolutive ergative pronominal prefixes before the stem if there isn't already an absolutive ergative pronominal prefix in pre-stem position, mu un cur 9. Topic. Mu ni cur. He went in there. As opposed to mu ni cur 9. Mu ni and cur 9 equals, mu ni n cur. He brought in, caused, something or someone, to go in, there. Topic. Pronominal suffixes and conjugation The pronominal suffixes are, n, for the first and second person singular, e, for the third singular in maru ta and, o, in hamtu ta, enden, for the first plural, enzen, for the second plural, en, for the third plural in maru and, s, in hamtu the initial vowel in all of the above suffixes can be assimilated to the root. The general principle for pronominal agreement in conjugation is that in hamtu ta, the transitive subject is expressed by the prefix, and the direct object by the suffix, and in the maru ta it is the other way round, as for the intransitive subject, it is expressed, in both ta's, by the suffixes and is thus treated like the object in hamtu and like the subject in maru except that its third person is expressed, not only in hamtu but also in maru, by the suffixes used for the object in the hamtu ta. A major exception from this generalization are the plural forms, in them, not only the prefix as in the singular, but also the suffix expresses the transitive subject. Additionally, the prefixes of the plural are identical to those of the singular, or, e, e, n, b, as opposed to the mi, re, ne that are presumed for non-pre-stem position, and some scholars believe that the prefixes of the first and second person are, n, rather than, e, when they stand for the object. Before the pronominal suffixes, a suffix, e, d, with a future or related modal meaning can be inserted, accounting for occurrences of e in the third person singular maru of intransitive forms, because of its meaning, it can also be said to signal maru in these forms. Examples for ta and pronominal agreement, hamtu is rendered with past tense, maru with present, i gub n, I stood, or I stand, i n gub n, he placed me, or I place him, I sug enden. We stood, stand, 
I n dim enden, he created us, or we create him, mu e, dim enden, we created someone or something, I three gub b two. Topic. I gub ed. He will, must stand. Ib 2 gub b 2. I b gub e. He places it. I b dim een. They create it. I n dim s. They created someone or something. Or. He created them. I sug s. They stood. Or. They stand. Confusingly, the subject and object prefixes, n, b, e, are not commonly spelled out in early texts, although the full spellings do become more usual during the Third Dynasty of Ur in the Neo-Sumerian period and especially during the Late Sumerian period. Thus, in earlier texts, one finds mu ak and i3 ak e ak in early dynastic Lagash instead of mu un ak and in ak for, mu n ak, and, i n ak, he, she made, and also mu ak instead of mu e ak. You made. Similarly, pre or three texts also spell the first and second person suffix n as e, making it coincide with the third person in the Maru form. Topic stem. The verbal stem itself can also express grammatical distinctions. The plurality of the absolutive participant can be expressed by complete reduplication of the stem or by a suppletive stem. Reduplication can also express plurality of the action itself, intensity or iterativity. With respect to ta marking, verbs are divided in four types, hamtu is always the unmarked ta. The stems of the first type, regular verbs, do not express ta at all according to most scholars, or, according to M. Yoshikawa and others, express maru ta by adding an assimilating e, as in gub b2 or gub bu versus gub which is, however, nowhere distinguishable from the first vowel of the pronominal suffixes except for intransitive maru third person singular. The second type express maru by partial reduplication of the stem as ker 9 versus ku 4 ku 4, the third type express maru by adding a consonant te versus teg, 3, and the fourth type use a suppletive stem dug 4 versus e. Thus, as many as four different suppletive stems can exist, as in the admittedly extreme case of the verb to go, g, n, to go. Hamtu sing, do, maru sing, e, re 7, hamtu plur, sub 2, maru plur, Topic. Other issues The nominalizing suffix, a, converts non-finite and finite verbs into participles and relative clauses, some ma, given, mu na and some ma, which he gave to him, who gave, something, to him, etc. Adding, a, after the future, modal suffix, ed, produces a form with a meaning similar to the Latin gerundive, some mu da. Topic. Which will, should be given. On the other hand, adding a locative terminative, e, after the, ed, yields a form with a meaning similar to the Latin ad plus gerund acc, construction, sum mu de 3. In order, to give. The copula verb, me, to be, is mostly used as an enclitic, men, men, am, menden, menzen, a, mes. The imperative mood construction is produced with a singular hamtu stem, but using the maru agreement pattern, by turning all prefixes into suffixes, mu na and sum, he gave, something, to him, mu na e sum mu un z 2 n, you, plur, gave, something, to him, sum mu na ab, give it to him, sum mu na ab z 2 n, give, plur, it to him. Compare the French tu la louis dons, vous la louis donnas, present tense, don la louis, donnas la louis. Topic. Syntax The basic word order is subject-object-verb, verb finality is only violated in rare instances, in poetry. The moving of a constituent towards the beginning of the phrase may be a way to highlight it, as may the addition of the copula to it. The so-called anticipatory genitive e to a lugal by the owner of the house, temple, lit. of the house, its owner is common and may signal the possessor's topicality. There are various ways to express subordination, some of which have already been hinted at, they include the nominalization of a verb, which can then be followed by case morphemes and possessive pronouns when he entered, and included in prepositional 
constructions e.g. er a ma ru ba er three ra ta back flood conjugation prefix sweep over nominalizing suffix genitive suffix ablative suffix topic from the back of the flood sweeping over after the flood had swept over subordinating conjunctions such as ud da when if to come by if are also used, though the coordinating conjunction U3 and a Semitic adoption is rarely used. A specific problem of Sumerian syntax is posed by the numerous so called compound verbs, which usually involve a noun immediately before the verb, forming a lexical or idiomatic unit, e.g., su less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 t, lit. hand approach. Topic. Receive. Igi. Less than pre greater than slash pre greater than dot 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 do eight lit. I open. C. Some of them are claimed to have a special agreement pattern that they share with causative constructions. Their logical object, like the kazi, receives in the verb the directive infix, but in the noun the dative suffix if animate and the directive if inanimate. Topic. Sample text Topic. Inscription by Entomina of Lagas This text was inscribed on a small clay cone c. 2400 BC. It recounts the beginning of a war between the city-states of Lagas and Uma during the early dynastic III period, one of the earliest border conflicts recorded, Rhyme 1.09.05.01. Topic. See also List of extinct languages of Asia List of languages by first written accounts Pennsylvania Sumerian Dictionary Sumerian Literature Topic. References Topic. Bibliography Topic. Further reading Topic. External links General Akkadian Unicode font to see cuneiform text archive Linguistic overviews Gabor Zoliomi, An Introduction to the Grammar of Sumerian Open Access Textbook, Budapest 2017 Introduction to Sumerian Grammar by Daniel A. Foxvog at CDLI archive a descriptive grammar of Sumerian by Abraham Hendrik Jaegersma preliminary version Sumerish an overview of Sumerian by Ernst Kausen, in German chapter 6 of McGee Shea Les Chaldanes et Les Origines Acadiens 1874 by François Lenormand The State of the Art in the Dawn of Sumerology by the author of the first ever four grammar of Acadian dictionaries electronic Pennsylvania Sumerian dictionary EPSD elementary Sumerian glossary by Daniel A Foxvog after M Civil 1967 Sumerian Lexicon version 3.0 by John A Halloran Sumerian Lexicon Electronic Search Corpora the Electronic Text Corpus of Sumerian Literature ETCSL includes translations CDLI Cuneiform Digital Library Initiative a large corpus of Sumerian texts in transliteration largely from the early dynastic and er 3 periods accessible with images Research online publications arising from the ETCSL project PDF Structural Interference from Akkadian in Old Babylonian Sumerian by Gabor Zoliomi PDF Other online publications by Gabor Zoliomi PDF The Life and Death of the Sumerian Language in Comparative Perspective by Peter Mikulowski Online publications by Kale Johnson PDF Elements de Linguistique Sumerienne by Pascal Adinger, 1993, in French, at the Digital Library RERO Doc, Parts 1-4 4, part 5. The Origin of Ergativity in Sumerian, and the Inversion in Pronominal Agreement, a historical explanation based on Neo-Aramaic parallels, by E. Coghill and G. Deutscher, 2002 at the Internet Archive.